<laughs> Howdy peeps, how are you guys doing? Today we're gonna do a very important reaction to this video that, you know, a few people have asked me to do a reaction. At first I was like, no, nah, you know, it's too long. Uh, how can I upload a, a reaction that's over an hour, right? You know, it, it's, it's not possible. Uh, and, and plus recording it, 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 it's not easy as well. But, you know what, I said, fuck it, let's do it. Uh, and yeah, so this is the Mexican-American border at Tale of Two Colors. I have no idea what the video is about. Uh, it's over an hour long, so uh, there's definitely a lot of history to it. That's the only thing. I yeah, without further ado, guys, let's go. Mexican-American You know, southern, southwestern music. In Arizona's southern county of Santa Cruz, you will find the city of Nogales. At first glance, an average American city with a population of slightly over 20,000. Yeah. Most of these are families of which the median income lies at almost $30,000 a year. The average age is 34, and despite the many problems of the American healthcare system, the population is healthy. There's a low child mortality rate, cost of health insurance is low compared to the American average, and residents of Nogales are healthier than the American average. Unemployment lies at 7%, 29% of the population have a high school degree, 35% have college degrees, and 32% have not finished high school. The majority of the educated population is younger than 44, and education level are steadily increasing by generation. What makes Nogales stand out in the American average is that the median income is half of the American average and that poverty rates are twice as high as the American average, with a population in poverty of 30%. With this, Nogales lies beneath the Arizona average, but still does considerably better than many towns in other US states. Most working people yeah, are employed sure. in construction, retail, and transportation. Founding a business in Nogales is easy and can be done without having to pay bribes or- Okay, so here is what I think is gonna happen. So he's gonna do, you know, there's two cities of Nogales, Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales, Mexico in Sonora. So I guess he's gonna do a comparison, like, look, this is life in Nogales on the U.S. side of the border, and this is life in Nogales on the Mexican side of the border, and it's gonna be super bad. Fear of being unnecessarily obstructed by the government or organized crime. The city, in fact, provides a handy guide for all the steps required on its homepage intent to attract more business. Several of the residents founded businesses and bigger American corporations settled offshoots in the city. The crime rate is low, violent crimes are rare, some crimes are non-existent, and overall the crime rates of Nogales, despite occasional brief increases, are lower than the state average and the national average. The people of Nogales also have a say in the political matters of their community, state, and country. They elect a mayor and a city council that is accountable to them and can be legally removed for transgressions or electorally removed should there be disapproval. The same can be said of their state senator elected through the second senate district, the governor, and the federal representatives. They are part of the third congressional district of Arizona with an elected congressman accountable to them, as well as a senator. All in all, political representatives representatives tasked with providing the basic infrastructure and services a community need to prosper, who will be voted out if they fail at that task. Nogales is by all standards just another average American city, with average Americans living their average American lives. But there is one thing which makes this place very special. Take a walk uh, from border. the McDonald's down Crawford Street, take the right down Arroyo Boulevard, and you might end up at the La Roja Bar, which is in Nogales, in the state of Sonora, in Mexico. Nogales used to be one town founded by a cattle rancher family in 1841. Ten years later, the Americans bought large parts of desert borderlands from Mexico, and the line drawn by that Gatson purchase split the town in two. The average median income in yeah get some purchase the last bit of land to be either bought or conquered by the u.s to form the mainland u.s of course alaska hawaii yada 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 but this was the last bit of the u.s to become the u.s this nogales is ten thousand dollars a third of that just a few feet away 
The percentage of people with college degrees lies at 18%. The majority of the population don't even have high school education. Educational standards are so low that there is a local phenomenon of residents signing their children up in high schools in the other Nogales, resulting in a daily walk to school across the border for many kids. Housing conditions are bad. Some people live in shacks that lack basic commodities and infrastructure. In large parts of the town, drinking water is contaminated by sewage, garbage, and occasionally by industrial discharge. The child mortality rate is high. There's a considerably lower average lifespan and life expectancy. Roads, highways, sewers, and other basic infrastructure are barely maintained and constantly broken. Many residents are forced to scramble together and build their own basic infrastructure, such as access to water, yep. electricity, or sewage systems by themselves, as both the federal and local government fail to provide basic services. The crime rate is high. There are between two to three murders a week, three to four kidnappings a week. Oh. Many local businesses are fronts run by organized crime. Using public transportation or taxis is an invitation to getting robbed. Calling the police for help might result in a considerable wait due to the police being understaffed throughout the state due to targeted assassinations of police officers who refuse to take bribes by organized crime, resulting in fewer people being willing to take such a life-threatening job. To top all that off, saying that the police has a corruption problem is putting it mildly. The state in general is known to have one of the highest rates of domestic violence and violence against women in the country. The current governor of the state was elected after her predecessor fled into the underground due to a massive manhunt and international investigation for bribery, extortion, racketeering and corruption. She is a member of the PRI, a corrupt party that in collaboration with oligarchs and organized crime ruled Mexico as a one-party state for almost a century. Her predecessor ran for a party promising to end that corruption, but that party turned out to be just as corrupt. And if you want to open a business in Nogales, you will have to bribe either the local corrupt politician, criminal gang, dirty cop, or even all three of them for that privilege, and they might still choose to rob you anyway. And with all of this combined, keep in mind that Nogales, on average, has a lower crime rate, lower police corruption, higher average education, and higher standard of living than the Mex- That's the worst part of it. That, you know, you might hear this and say, wow, Nogales, you know, one of the craziest parts of Mexico. It's not. It's actually one of the, in some regards, it's one of the better parts of Mexico. A lot of these border towns, and border cities, you know, if you've been to TJ, right, if you live in San Diego and you've been to Tijuana, you know that, you know, yeah, it's very Americanized there, people use the US dollar as a second currency, uh, you know, and because of that, business is sort of better, and the economy is sort of better, and I think crime is one of those things that it's not really better, but, yeah. Yeah, imagine this, but in southern Mexico, it gets worse. And, and sometimes me seeing this, I get shocked. Like, is this the same country that I live in? Is this the same country that I, I you know, I have no problems with my water, my electricity? And, you know, being in Mexico City, you're also, very, you're also very secluded to the reality of the rest of the country. Which is this, people living in shacks. and, and uh, It's just a terrible, terrible situation. It's like an average. Ironically, the only thing better in the Mexican Nogales compared to the American Nogales oh. is the quality of healthcare, as the thousands oh, of yeah. annual American healthcare tourists can probably attest to. So, why are the two Nogales so different? What is it that makes these two places that are only a few feet apart so vastly separate in everything else? Well, why are some places poor and some places wealthy? This is a question that many have even more different answers to, and Nogales is a great place to find an answer. It isn't geography or climate, as the geographic determinists the may same. claim, because both Nogales share the same geography and climate. It is not big business, capitalism or socialism, as both cities have the same class structure and market system. It isn't ethnicity, culture, religion, demographics, or as some dumber people may even claim, race because both Nogales are majority Catholic, share similar demographics, and the population of the American Nogales is 95% of what Americans call Latinos. 
When you boil everything down to basics, there is in the end only one single thing separating the two Nogales. A border. This is a story about the creation of state and economic institutions, the failure of these institutions, and how the legacy of failed institutions impact your life. Yeah. Chapter 1. Conquistadors, Puritans, Slaves and Quakers. When Christopher Columbus landed in what he thought was India, but what we now know was Hispaniola, he encountered the native peoples of the Arawak. Returning to Spain, he reported to the king that the Arawak are so naive and so free with their possessions that no one who has not witnessed them would believe it. When you ask for something they have, they never say no. To the contrary, they offer to share with everyone. Columbus came from a Europe of war and conquest in which the idea of sharing as caring didn't make much sense. So he concluded in his report to the king that if he got enough money to sail there again, he would return with as much gold as they want and as many slaves as they ask. And hereby, the tone was set for the first mode of operation for the first Spanish colonists in the Americas. Sail over there, enslave the natives, bring these slaves home and sell them. However, upon returning to the Caribbean, this plan didn't work. Of the 500 enslaved Arawak that he tried to return to Spain, 200 died, and the remaining were so weak they could not be sold for the fortunes that he had promised. So he had to make good on the second promise of bringing the gold, and created the second mode of operation for colonists. He returned to Chichao in what is now Haiti, enslaved all the Arawak he could find, and forced them to dig in hastily built mines in the mountains for any scrap of gold dust that they could find. The task made no economic, ethical or even just basic sense. There was barely any gold in Hispaniola, yet the Spaniards would brutally punish the Arawak for not finding any of the gold that didn't even exist in the first place. The result was rebellion, massacre and genocide. Within two years of the 250,000 Arawak, half were dead. Columbus fell out of grace with the crown, but the conquistadors had learned the new blueprint for what they would do in the Spanish Caribbean. Instead of digging for gold that didn't exist, they enslaved the natives and forced them to grow sugar and coffee on Caribbean plantations starting in 1515. However, with this they encountered a new problem by 1550, when of the 250,000 Arawak, only 500 were left. They kept dying. The brutality and indignity of the slave plantations and the extreme disruptions to their lives killed them. So they had to be replaced at cost through slaves, kidnapped and shipped in from Africa by the Portuguese. The third mode you know, of... You gotta understand that the Taino people, uh, the indigenous people of a lot of these islands, they are pretty much extinct. extinct. The only remain reminder of, uh, of, of these people are genetics, the DNA of the current people that inhabit the island of Hispaniola, in this case Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And a lot of these people on their DNA, they have some ancestry that, you know, traces back all the way to the indigenous people of the island of Hispaniola and the other islands. Uh, but, but these people are gone. You, you can't just go and find them. They are extinct and they were extinct because of uh, the extremely horrific treatment by the Europeans, you know, like Spanish, British, they all fucked up. And yeah, you know, it's just really sad to think that people, groups, groups, people go extinct. Operating a colony was thereby born, slave plantations with imported slaves from Africa. It would spread throughout the Spanish Caribbean. Now, if you wonder why there's a lot of African people on the Caribbean, now you know better. And be copied throughout British, French, Dutch and Portuguese colonies throughout the region. But as the Spanish ventured further into the Americas, they found another mode of operating a colony, a means of building a society that would fundamentally shape much of Latin American social, economic and political structures to this very day. In 1519, Hernán Cortés ventured into the highlands of Mexico and the found right something and that the Spaniards had been looking for for a very long time. A settled civilization. The Aztecs did not only have a state, taxation system, division of labor, bureaucracy and empire. They had a state structure with castes, from king to clergy to warrior to peasants, that formed the foundation for the institutions of their state to function. 
And that state was a feudal state with an unquestionable set of god kings who were in their power absolute and unchallengeable. Here Cortes would do what had worked in feudal Europe for centuries before. If you wanted to conquer a king, kill the king, take his throne, seize control of the state. Now you are the king and the state is yours. The Aztec emperor Montezuma was kidnapped and murdered. Cortes took his place, installed himself as the new absolute ruler and acquired the wealth of the state as well as the absolute power of its feudal institutions. And although these conquistadors did not become kings in name, they created a class of colonial elites that pretty much had the power of absolute kings by taking over from the previous kings and acquiring the authority of their state institutions. The wider system throughout the Spanish Americas became known as the encomienda, which means commission. The conquistadors conquered a people and then these people and the land were assigned as an encomienda to the individual conquistadors who then owned the land and the people on it within a feudal structure. This structure remained in place until the 1820s and was further expanded through the import of African slaves and Spanish settlers. An additional development within Spanish American society was the development of the cachique, which comes from the Arawak word casequa, meaning tribal chief. Oh, yeah. Cachique today is more associated with the term small tyrant. It was used to describe subordinate Native American chieftains who entered Spanish society to... Yeah, I think th this picture is perfect to describe what happened. Because the Aztec Empire, and I'm sure it's the same with the Inca Empire, but, you know, it was an empire. And it had a lot of people groups inside it that didn't really like the Aztecs. So what did Hernan Cortes do? Well, divide and conquer, right? Like the Romans. And it worked. It worked, it, it put native native tribes against each other and it made the Spanish job easier because, the, you know, the, the Aztec Empire, they had a huge army, huge population. And you got to remember, the Spanish Empire had to bring soldiers all the way from Spain to the new Spain. So it wasn't an, an easy job. And even if, if, if you bring all these soldiers, now they got to die trying to conquer these people. So instead, you know, what this guy said, you kill the king, you take over the empire and, you know, it's easy peasy, right? retain the social I guess what this what I guess what he's trying to do with all this is uh, showing how Mexico was built this is the foundation of Mexico all of this is important to understand Mexico today and you know the US was different right uh, the US shaped its first colonies like on Britain right well different you know it's not Britain it's not the UK but it was very similar. They brought civilization with them. In this case, they took over civilization. While in, uh, from the United Kingdom to America, they, they brought civilization with them. And yeah, I guess that's the main difference between the founding of the two countries. The status. These cachiques would then, similar to conquistadors, rule as small tyrants over stretches of land and the people within it to exploit them for their own benefits and for the Spanish crown. As a result, society was expanded not just in numbers, but in structure by La Casta. When European settlers arrived, the conquistadors developed into a social elite that didn't wish to share its power. The result was a class and racially mixed feudal social hierarchy. Nobles born in Spain stood at the top, followed by nobles born in the New World, followed by poor whites born in Spain, followed by poor whites born in the Americas, followed by people of mixed race, followed by Indios, followed by freed slaves, and at the bottom lay the slaves. Yep. So, if you can research on racism in Latin America, it's really interesting how a lot of these old dynamics still go through. I mean, in Mexico, about 90% of the population is white, but if you go to like a nice upper class neighborhood in, Me in Mexico City, or any city in Mexico, you'll find that the people are white. And... I, and even you saw the governor of the state of Sonora, the, the lady we saw on the beginning of the episode, her name was Claudia Pavlovich. She is from Polish descent, or I think either Polish or some sort of Slavic country descent. You know, she's white. A lot of the politicians are white, the businessmen are white. And then you find like 80% of Mexico is either you know, it's mixed race or Native American. And A rigid, authoritarian, and strictly hierarchical society with stipulations in place that limited any social mobility. 
This socio-economic structure would remain in place throughout the Spanish Americas for centuries and to some extent still to this very day. The fundamental purpose of it would remain to enrich the motherland of Spain. Only raw materials were produced in plantations and mines brought to the harbors to be exported yeah. to Spain. This was the purpose of the colonies of, of New Spain and, and Mexico and all the others. It wasn't to populate this with Spanish settlers. This wasn't an extension of empire or, or, or Spanish civilization. This was just, you know, get a bunch of gold, get silver, get sugar, get wood, anything that we can get on our hands of. We, we'll get our hands on and take it back to Spain. That was it. You know, the, the British colonies were a little bit different. You know, these were the colonies where they would send the undesirables, like the, the prisoners, and they would build a civilization upon the, uh, the British way of life. Where they would be used to manufacture Not products the same. that were shipped back to be sold to the colonies, thereby creating an economic system of dependencies. There was no economic specialization, plurality into other sectors, or further innovation. Worse still, it disconnected and disintegrated the Spanish colonies economically. Before the Spaniards, there had been an indigenous trade network stretching almost the entire continent. With the arrival of the Spanish, the colonies didn't trade amongst themselves, creating even further dependency on outsiders, making Spanish America an economy dependent on foreign markets for its produce and raw materials. And since the owners of the plantations and mines were Spanish nobles, often born and raised in Spain, and detached from this land and its people, it started a sort of economic custom of foreign ownership of the economic structures of the region. A business culture in which these elites, who were the owners of economic assets... Yeah, you know, just imagine, these people don't give a fuck about the country. They don't care about New Spain. Uh, they only care about becoming wealthy and taking some riches back to Spain. So when Mexico becomes independent and all the, the, the landowners go, all the nobles, they go back to Spain because where the fuck would they stay? Mexico becomes a mess because the people who had the resources and the power are gone and they leave a power vacuum that, that needs to be solved and, and all the groups that were left behind then get into conflict. And that's pretty much the history of Latin America. If You, if, you know, that's why... that's why it's so unstable. The US was built on stability. The US was pretty stable, at least compared, I mean, it wasn't perfect. And I'm not saying everyone was rich and happy and you know, Americans had their own problems, but they had good leadership because the people who had the power cared and stayed in the US, you know? George, George, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but George Washington started out as a British Lieutenant General, right? You know, he started serving for the UK and he didn't left. He stayed in the US. He fought and eventually created the US of A uh, in, in, in Latin America. It worked differently, totally different. Acted with impunity and complete disregard for those who they considered to be beneath them and almost foreign, even though they were in their land. They would control these populations with draconian punishments, with a foreign Spanish army forbidding the ownership of firearms and banning free movement and commerce. Laws which were enforced through the iron fist of one of the most powerful entities in human history, the Spanish Empire. This situation also raised an increasing resentment amongst the wealthy elites, despite all the benefits they had. These only produced raw materials, had to sell to Spain, could not trade with outsiders, and could not expand into and develop other economic sectors with their raw materials. We will see where this would lead to later. Meanwhile in Europe, there was a lot of envy and spite. Through getting a head start, the Spanish and Portuguese had gotten the best parts of the New World. The most valuable slave plantation economies of Cuba and Hispaniola had gone to the Spanish, as well as the silver mines of Potosi. The Portuguese seized control of the Atlantic slave trade, and the French, English and Dutch were left with scraps for their own slave plantations. Consequently, their early efforts focused around seizing the enormous profits of the Caribbean piracy. slave economies for themselves through piracy against the Spanish, grabbing whatever was left in the Caribbean and taking Spanish slave plantations by force. The lands in North America were left untouched for almost a century. Early Spanish settlers quickly realized that the output of plantations in the North were only an eighth of the output in the Caribbean. The North was seen as inhospitable, uneconomical, and wild. 
but it was the only thing left to grab, so by the 1600s the English tried and failed at Roanoke. So they tried again in 1607. Sent by the Virginia Company, these settlers landed in the lands of the Powhatan, in what we now know as Virginia, and founded a place called Jamestown. In popular history, these early colonists are described as utopian settlers who wish to build and farm There's a new a whole society. Movie about them. And that is simply not true. The colonists had arrived with weapons and goldsmiths, intent to do as Cortes and Pizarro had done, kidnap the Indian king, seize control of his kingdom, and melt down the gold. However, when they invited the Indian king, Wahahun Sunakok, to an English crowning ceremony at which they had intended to kidnap him, his response literally was, I shall not take such bait. He then enforced the blockade of Jamestown. The colonists had hoped that the Indians would actually feed them after they had killed and replaced their king, as Cortes had done with the Aztecs. So they had not brought anyone who knew how to grow crops, cure thing. meat, or even how to hunt or fish. So they starved, including all the goldsmiths, and resorted to cannibalism. Indian societies of North America were different from those in the South and Central America. The population density in pre-colonial America was lower in the North, and the peoples were organized in semi-nomadic yes, and loosely connected confederations. There were not the masses of people to enslave, farms and plantations to conquer, gold to steal, silver to mine, and sugar to grow as in the South. But above all, there were no state structures and institutions to take over. The Indians of North America, by and large, lived in stateless societies. The Spanish model of colonization simply couldn't work here. James Smith, a mercenary captain on the governing council of Jamestown, realized first that the South American colonial model would not work here. He wrote to the Virginia Company to send gardeners, farmers, fishermen and artisans, and since the Virginia Company had made no profits in the colony's two years of existence, they decided to implement a radical change. The colony would no longer be run by a council, instead it would be run by an all-powerful governor who implemented a forced labor system amongst European colonists and imported penal labor. The laws of the colony, known as the Laws Divine, Moral and Martial, punished with death the leaving of the colony, the mingling with Indians and the theft of food. It also punished with death the sale and trading of any commodities and produce made by the colonists amongst themselves or to anyone except the Virginia Company. The Virginia Company couldn't enslave and exploit the Indians, so it tried to exploit colonists, in barracks with assigned food rations and with governor-ordered work details. They were to grow produce, hunt for pelts and produce timber, which they would hand over to the company governor to be shipped back and sold for company profit. However, this also didn't work. Who the Virginia Company sent to be forced labor were people who were no longer welcome in England, sometimes just pickpockets and drunkards picked from the rabble of 1600s London, people who had little respect for the authority of the English state, let alone some English company, and in this place the but English... Of course, that was the difference. The Americans were rebellious, I mean, from the inception, right? People who were already rebels were sent to America and later Australia of course, what, what, what are they supposed to do? Love England? That was, I think, the difference. And that's why, I think, you know, I never say, oh, the U.S. was based on the British model. Because it was not. People never really liked England from the very beginning. It was like, well, why would I uh, love England if they imprisoned me? They sent me here to work my ass off. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. Monarchy had even less authority. The imported laborers simply started running away, beyond company control, into the Virginia frontier. They built their own farms, their own outposts, their own trade networks, and they formed their own militias. Instead of laborers, they became settlers. Unlike Spain, neither England nor the Virginia Company had the means to enforce their order. So, the tried and tested colonial order of forced labor under a colonial elite collapsed. The Virginia Company needed a different approach, which they enacted in 1619. 
They noticed that settlers working their own land produced more and worked harder than forced labor. So from now on, the Virginia Company imported people as settlers and not as forced laborers. To sign a contract, according to which, in exchange for years spent in indentured servitude, every settler was given 50 acres of land by the company and wow. 50 acres more for every family member a settler would bring. A general assembly was introduced, the members of which were voted on by every landowning man which functioned as a counterweight to the company governor. The settlers could still only sell their products and produce to the Virginia Company, but the company, and by that extent the crown, could not simply force their will upon the colonists. They had to govern through negotiation, concession, and ultimately, pragmatism. Though Virginia would largely remain feudal, the governance structure that developed was one dependent on cooperation with the masses. In 1632, the crown tried itself without the company. When King Charles I gifted 10 million acres of land around the Chesapeake Bay to Cecilus Calvert, the second Baron of Baltimore, who founded oh, a town at Maryland. the bay and named his lands Maryland after the king's wife. They intended to create a society of plots of land owned by nobles shaped after the English aristocracy with serfs to work and serve. And just as in Virginia, it all failed. There was so much land that if you didn't like being a serf in the lands you were assigned to, you could just move to other land. And Lord Baltimore didn't have the means to evict settlers from the enormous 10 million acres of land he claimed to own. Baltimore had to provide incentives for settlers, such as a stay in government. Therefore, an assembly was introduced in Maryland which voted to become a colony of the king thereby removing Lord Baltimore of all power in Baltimore. In New England, a different type of settler arrived. English Puritans, who specifically came to build a new utopian society detached from all the legal and state frameworks of the society they left behind. A kingdom of God, in which religious norms and communal values were enforced to keep peace in a virtuous and very intolerant society trade with any English companies was a secondary issue to them. What mattered to them was the construction of their new and self-sufficient society. Their communal values had priority over not just individual liberties, but also the values and laws of the English crown. And these settlers would resist attempts of total control over them by England more than any other colonists. <laughs> In Pennsylvania, Delaware, and the surrounding Midlands, Quakers, Mennonites, and other persecuted Protestant minorities of England, Germany, Poland, and Scandinavia settled to build a pacifist society of self-sufficient small farmers, people who wanted to be left alone and to themselves with as little interference by any authority. In the South, English Caribbean slave plantation owners expanded into the Carolinas and Georgia for more land, for more plantations, to import more slaves into. These settlers saw themselves as the descendants of Norman English aristocracy, which they weren't, and they would build a brutal slave society on a found- I mean, you could argue, uh, you know, that the Civil War was due to happen from this moment on because North and South were, were born differently. I mean, the people who settled them settled those states for completely different reasons. I mean, they had completely different purposes. Uh, yeah. You could say that the Civil War, you know, it didn't start here, but it was due to happen from this moment. Foundation of cruelty and profit. These settlers may have professed loyalty to Britain, but their main loyalty, first was and foremost, money. was to their bottom line. They implemented their own brutal social system built upon controlling a slave society with ruthless violence, systematic oppression, and cruelty and they would resist anyone who challenged yep. that socio-economic framework. While the Appalachians were settled by Scottish Presbyterians from the Scottish borderlands and highlands, a people organized in clan and family structures who couldn't give any less of a damn about what an <laughs> English crown that they had yeah, spent sure. centuries rebelling against told them to do. They purposefully sought out the hard-to-reach borderlands of the colonies in the Appalachian That's mountains and forests, to be as far away as possible from any English authority and to live their lives as they saw fit. <laughs> the social and economic structures that developed were entirely different from those in South America. Spanish American society was dominated by an aristocracy ruling over serfs. Spanish colonies didn't trade with each other, 
and only exported to and imported from Spain, and that Spain enforced its rule through blunt military force. In the English North American colonies, the colonies traded with each other, specialized and even started manufacturing themselves, built their own cultural, social and economic structures which were increasingly independent from Britain. A society of landowners developed who had an ever-increasing say in how they were governed. Instead of being exploited by lords, these landlords imported slaves to exploit themselves or worked the land themselves for themselves, which is a story deserving of its own video. And far distant Britain could only maintain sovereignty and rule over these colonies through negotiation and concession, and as it would soon find out, not through brutal force. <laughs> two very different social structures started to develop in the New World. And as much as some know-nothing English twats with very posh English accents may tell you that American society developed out of old English customs and traditions of monarchy, the reality is that it by and large evolved out of a rebellion against these things. But how did these societies develop so differently and why does it matter? Oh snap, chapter two. All right, all right. I think we're gonna leave this video uh, here. It's been a long time, but we're definitely gonna react part two and I'm gonna I'm try to upload them at the exact same time. So you guys don't, uh, you know, don't lose the upload or you don't see part one without part two. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna stop the recording.